it is my honor uh, to introduce to you uh, Professor Victor Mufke, who is a uh, who did his PhD at Stanford University, has taught at such institutions as Yale, and is currently professor of English at uh, the University of Virginia, where he also directs the Center for Liberal Arts. He will tell us a bit about, about that center, uh, but he has a broad range of academic interests, uh, uh, British and Irish literature in particular. Uh, he has uh, he's an expert in te the teaching of uh, college expository writing and has been more recently working al also with uh, teachers uh, K through 12. And he's going to be talking to some extent about that experience. So we're, it's a real honor to have him here. I've been looking forward to this talk uh, for quite some time, as I think many of you have. And by the way, thank you for coming. I know that the weather is really nice, and there's not much room. We have two more chairs, I think, over here, which will have to be used. And, there's and a, one chair here. There's a couple so we back should, here as well. We should be able to find a spot for everybody. And if, if people want to find some spot, bring it to uh, the okay. chairs. But, uh, so excellent. So a big round of, of applause for our speaker. Thank you, Adam, for having me. Thank you for that introduction. Thank you particularly for describing me as having a broad range of interests. I have described it to Pro Professor Graves as having a short attention span <laughs> of phrasing the same um, thing. I, I, I do want to note before I start that the creation of DeFi is a, is, is a wonderful um, uh, thing here, um, and that it's particularly important uh, for such an entity to happen in uh, the most prominent city in Colorado, a state to which a lot of the rest of the country is uh, looking as a, a kind of bellwether for all kinds of things um, happening in the United States. I, I want to say, too, how um, grateful I am, particularly for the invitation for Professor Graves, um, who is one of the most intellectually nimble um, people I've ever had, had the pleasure to work with. I had a, a, a gig I hired him for some years ago where I asked him to do all kinds of things beyond what was uh, would have been reasonable for any human being to do, and he did every one of them uh, amazingly. Uh, he also, not all of you may know this, is an incredible dancer, so when I <laughs> refer to nimbleness, I mean that uh, a number of different um, uh, kinds, and, and really I say all this partly because um, what I um, mean to model uh, today is a certain kind of humanistic nimbleness, I hope it will strike you as, I'm not going to dance, that would be horrible, <laughs> but I'm going to try to do another um, thing. Um, I just, uh, I'm going to just pause for a second to try to frame the question I have on the, the screen, uh, particularly for the undergraduates who are in the room, uh, and ask you to think as I, as I speak, if you will, uh, about this version of that um, question. It would go something like, when bad things happen in your community, or your studies, the, the work that you're doing at Metropolitan State or wherever you're going to school, are your studies, humanistic or otherwise, are they enabling, disabling, disabling or irrelevant to thinking about a response to those uh, events? And um, I'm going to try to offer a kind of optimistic answer. I, I like talking about it and have happy endings to them, so I'm going to try that today, even though I'm going to talk about a lot of stuff that, um, that is, is hard. Um, I want to suggest that we may be in a, a moment in which the humanities are being repositioned as ways of responding to crisis. Um, when I was an undergraduate, the answer I thought I was being taught in response to a question like this was, would have been something like, um, the humanities take the long and broad view. Uh, they are, by definition, uh, the, by definition, the category of the human is to be associated in terms of categories that transcend time and geography. So that in moments of crisis, what the humanities would teach us to do would be to check our rash impulses, our inclination to respond vengefully or immediately, or in ways that respond to violence with uh, violence. And so I've spent my teaching career, I, I teach 20th and 21st century uh, literature most of the time, and I teach texts like um, Joyce's Ulysses and Virginia Woolf's novels and poems by T.S. Eliot and Claude McKay, complicated texts uh, that often take a lot of work to think through as responses to occasions of crisis. And I found over the years that I share with my students a certain kind of impatience about the complexity and difficulty of those 
uh, text. We often feel in a hurry to respond to the things that bother us in the, the world. And so it's necessary to, to decide whether the hard work of thinking through the text in their response to these um, crises would be worth the, uh, the trouble. And I, I want to suggest today that we may be in a moment when it's possible to reposition the humanities as functioning in, in the immediate moment while still contextualizing crises as having long, long histories and broad consequences. So there are going to be three parts to my talk. I like, I like to be able to tell when I'm at something when it's coming near the end, and, and so I'll tell you that it has these uh, three parts uh, to it. Uh, in the first part, I'm going to try to uh, describe some events that happened uh, where I work in Charlottesville, Virginia uh, last summer. Uh, some of you may uh, remember those very well. Some of you may remember them vaguely. Forgive me if I go over matters that you're um, already well familiar uh, with, but I'll, I'll talk about uh, what those events look like from Charlottesville. I'll talk about a poem from somewhere very far from Charlottesville that seems to me pertinent to those uh, events. And then I want to talk about a couple of occasions with which I was uh, involved in the past academic year in response to the events of last summer to try to make this case for the humanities that I've been describing to you. And I notice that I'm sweating tremendously, and so I'm going to try to stop you with that. So, um, uh, so the event that uh, gave new significance to the place where I work, Charlottesville, uh, occurred on the same weekend as an annual family, family event uh, some hours away that I couldn't miss. Um, and so that, if, although I've been uh, in Charlottesville for much else that has been re relevant before and after, on the occasion of that weekend, I felt a little bit like what the poet Seamus Heaney describes in the poem that I'm going to talk to you about, uh, in, in his experience of being in a Spanish museum at the time when British troops were uh, firing on civilians in his native Northern Ireland, and that would be the um, connection I'll try to make with that um, poem. Um, so I'm talking about, about events um, that are remembered as having occurred uh, principally on August 12th of last um, year uh, that happened in Charlottesville last summer. Um, now what you'll find uh, most of the time, I, I, I tried this, is a very short timeline and uh, events happening in a much more confined space than seemed to be the case for us last year in Charlottesville, and that's a point that, a point that I'll re return to. The event now remembered was the third and final of a series of marches that white supremacists held, ostensibly to argue for the preservation of three statues that are on the one hand near the commercial center uh, of town, and on the other hand in a neighborhood that still has a significant African American population, but that had a much larger one that was driven out in the um, 1960s. And so um, what, I, what I mean to contrast here is this version of the map, uh, which would show you uh, the sites of these three uh, statues, one at Robert E. Lee Park, uh, which has been since renamed the Manson Emancipation uh, Park, that is a big statue of uh, Robert E. Lee, the Chief General of uh, uh, the Armies of Virginia and of the Confederacy uh, on, a, on a big horse. And, uh, then in Justice Park, there's a statue of the Confederate General uh, Stonewall uh, Jackson. And down here is a slightly smaller statue of an unnamed um, Confederate um, soldier. And uh, Charlottesville, in, uh, for quite some time prior to last summer, uh, had been uh, debating as a community um, what should be the place of these statues, literally, whether they should remain in place, whether they should be moved somewhere, somewhere else, whether they should be recontextualized in um, some way. But if, if you look uh, if you look up the events of last summer uh, uh, now online, what you'll find uh, is maps that point to a much more limited uh, uh, space. So that, that other map that I'm, uh, that I'm showing you is really just showing you this area, th this much of uh, downtown uh, uh, Charlottesville. Um, Whereas I, I'm, I'm trying to suggest that already the events of last August uh, involved a, a much a broader space, but it's a it's a it's a more it's 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 both a broader and deeper space than than that because that's part of town used to be called uh, Vinegar Hill, and from the Civil War, the end of the Civil War 
until it was destroyed uh, for commercial redevelopment in the 1960s. Uh, this was a thriving African-American um, neighborhood, a residential and um, commercial uh, neighborhood that was, was evicted uh, without compensation uh, for the creation of this um, uh, uh, downtown mall that is now the uh, central tourist site of the uh, city. And all that's really left of that uh, community is this little plaque in an alley behind the central uh, hotel on that um, uh, mall. Uh, so um, this had been a, uh, a, a thriving uh, community for some time when in the 1920s there was a, se a series of attempts to uh, intimidate the African-American population of that neighborhood. And the putting up of these statues was a central gesture towards such uh, intimidation. That's what they were uh, put up for. There's, I think, a tendency to think of these uh, statues as dating from the time of the Civil uh, War, but they are not put up uh, in Virginia until about 60 years, so you know, approximately uh, two generations um, uh, later. And they are uh, there. Uh, they are placed there um, in in order to uh, re-institute uh, a sense of Confederate and particularly white uh, identity in that um, neighborhood. So here's the local uh, front page on the day when the Lee statue um, was installed. The Charlottesville statues were in fact installed a short time after equivalent ones were installed in uh, Richmond. Which, is the, uh, which had been the capital of the Confederacy, is the capital of Virginia. It's about 70 miles away. Um, at the time of the Richmond uh, installations, the uh, public commemoration of those statues uh, was very explicitly announced as an all-white event. African Americans were barred from attending the putting up of those um, statues. There's nothing quite so uh, comparable in Charlottesville, I think partly because the neighborhood in which they were being um, put up was, was an African-American neighborhood, so that people would have uh, had to have been, uh, you know, banished from their homes, banished, banished from their uh, streets for uh, uh, for that to be made an all-white uh, event. But it, that was the uh, direction um, uh, in which uh, the installation of the statues uh, was meant to be um, headed. So on the 14th of May last year, um, so getting close to a year ago, uh, a man named Richard Spencer, who's a graduate of the University of um, Virginia, he majored in English, he was a student in my uh, department, led a torchlight rally that was in effect trying to duplicate this gesture of reclamation of the of reclamation of um, that uh, space. He, he knew uh, that the place was in the process of being renamed, that there was some talk of the statue being uh, removed, and Spencer wanted to make sure that this gesture uh, was was left in uh, place. So um, on, on the evening of May 14th, my wife, my son, and I were coming back from dinner on that downtown mall, and we saw a bunch of people holding uh, torches, and um, my wife and I said, oh, that's nice. Somebody's having some nice candlelit vigil. <laughs> <laughs> said, we need to get out of here now. And we, we spoke to our son the way parents do. No, 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 I'm sure it's fine. You've been watching too many movies. And my wife then went up and spoke to them, and we called the police. And I don't know that, um, I, don't, I don't know that um, we were the first ones to call, uh, call it in. This was a non-permitted mark. Uh, they, they had no permit for going um, into uh, Lee Park. Uh, as we headed back to our car, they began stomping uh, very, very aggressively and very, very loudly, and it became very clear that their presence there was to intimidate the um, uh, residents. When the police arrived on this occasion, they were very, very quick. The marchers were very quickly dispersed because they didn't have a, a, a permit. Um, when a, a comparable group came back slightly larger, about 100 people, uh, in July they did have a permit and they had announced their intentions, intentions long in advance. Uh, so the white supremacists were greatly outnumbered by counter-demonstrators who tried to bar their access to the um, uh, park. Uh, were very aware that this was meant to be a kind of gesture of reclamation and tried to stop it. And the police uh, 
uh, knowing that these uh, marchers had a permit and were protected, um, uh, had legal rights to um, enter, uh, began to take efforts to disperse the counter protesters. And they used both tear, tear gas and uh, pepper spray uh, to disperse them and were very much so. Uh, yeah, I think there's a blown up as uh, tear gas. Um, uh, the, um, they, they were, the police were very uh, strongly criticized for this act of dispersal of the uh, counter demonstrators, and that turns out, I think, to be very relevant to what happened um, afterwards. So the third march was, is the one that is remembered and that has uh, become much more uh, prominent, I think. It was, again, it was, uh, the, they had a permit for it. They had a permit for Saturday, August 12th at Lee Park. The city tried, anticipating violence, remembering what had happened in July, to get their permit switched so that they would have to march in a park outside the center of the city. But a judge said that that um, would be a violation of their rights to uh, assembly. So uh, it became quite clear that this was going to be a large march with a lot of people, lots of folks coming in from out of state, very heavily armed. That was made very um, explicit. And so folks in Charlottesville began talking about uh, what to do to respond to these events, uh, to this anticipated march of Saturday, August 12th. And I, I'm, I keep repeating the date Saturday, August 12th, because that was when it was anticipated for um, happening. And the, the, the next important thing I'm going to de describe is that it didn't start on Saturday, um, August 12th. But there was a lot of debate as to how to respond uh, to this. There were plenty of people remembering the history that I've described who felt that these folks shouldn't be allowed access to the center of, of the city and who thought that a quite considerable uh, mass counter-protest was the appropriate way to respond. A lot of entities took the position that the worst thing that folks objecting um, uh, to, 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 to these people could do would be to call attention to them. And so the University of Virginia, which is about a mile away from the center of town, scheduled for Saturday, August 12th, a whole day of counter-programming meant to draw as many members of the community to the campus away from the center of town um, as possible. And a number of entities, the Southern Poverty Law Center, uh, conspicuous uh, among them, um, with a long history of, of, of trying to counter hate groups, uh, said the last thing you want to do is anything that will call media attention to them. So that was the debate in anticipating Saturday, August 12th. On Friday night, August 11th, uh, they uh, showed up at the University of Virginia campus. This is an uh, image of uh, that, and I think it's one of the famous images of the event. So University of Virginia is a campus that is pretty active during the uh, summer, but by August 11th, it would be much less uh, crowded. That would be a, a time for people doing summer breaks of, of various kinds. And on a Friday night in the middle of August, it would be even emptier. So there were very few uh, people around. The people who were around were students who lived in the central part of the campus, what, what's called the uh, lawn. And uh, they uh, happened to be, so you only get to live on the lawn if you are a prominent student in some way, or if you're involved in student government, for um, instance. So this is a group of students who would have been very much involved in anticipating the events of August 12th, and they had gotten into the habit of following the hate groups who were organizing for August 12th online. So they noticed when it started to be clear on social media that these folks were showing up the night before on the campus rather than waiting till Saturday in the center of, of town. And I should say, it's the students who tweak to this. The police and university officials in no way anticipated this. And it was the, the students who notified the police and the uni university officials that this um, was coming down differently from what had been um, anticipated. Um, so the students uh, reading online uh, where these guys were headed, that they were going to uh, march to a statue of Thomas Jefferson that is very conspicuous on, on campus and that had been a, a, a subject of controversy, not quite as intense as the Lee statue, but, but, but with its own um, intensity. The students, though themselves largely ambivalent about Jefferson is, and his legacy, uh, surrounded the statue, holding up anti-white supremacist 
uh, sign, and they were attacked um, physically and quite viciously by um, these folks who outnumbered them by about um, uh, seven or ten to, to one. You get this isn't the whole of the image, but you get um, some sense of this um, ring of students around the campus. There are barely enough of them uh, to surround, um, to, to circle all around, around the statue, and you get some sense that they're surrounded. The, the, the people who are holding up um, um, fire are not like it's. They're not singing Happy Birthday. It's. it's um, they were incredible. The students were incredibly brave, um, hanging in there. So what what became clear is that the option of trying to avoid these folks from out of town was off the table, right? The idea had been they were going to the center of town. You could draw attention away from that center on the Saturday so as not to give them attention. But it became clear that they weren't going to stay by the script that people had anticipated, had been anticipating. So the university canceled its scheduled events for um, August 12th. And by and large, everyone who had an interest in uh, this went into the center of um, Charlottesville. The police. Um, having been uh, greatly criticized uh, for their intervention in July, remained kind of remarkably passive. You can see this on video. Uh, it's easy uh, to find as violence um, erupted in the uh, streets in a number of different pockets of the city simul uh, simultaneously. Um, there, there were uh, people um, beating each other quite badly. Um, only one shot was fired in the course of the day. That's a detail uh, that still remains of great importance to us in terms of anticipating what happens um, next. At a certain point, a group of counter-protesters trying to get out of this uh, kind of thing went uh, down a side street, uh, down the downtown mall, kind of narrow side street, uh, just to regroup and uh, to kind of get their bearings. And that's when one of the white supremacists drove supremacists drove his car into them, uh, killing a woman named Heather Heyer and injuring about 20 people quite badly. And I think um, the image gives a pretty good sense of, of how, um, how serious the injuries uh, would have been for this. Um, meanwhile, state troopers were uh, patrolling by helicopter, uh, trying to get a kind of bearing of the situation. And one helicopter crashed just outside of uh, town killing two of the state um, troopers. And so that, in terms of deaths, was the majority of the um, deaths. So um, I'm describing events for which I was not present. I was, not, I was out of town August 11th and 12th. And so I'm going to uh, focus now on a poem that talks about what it is to be absent when an event of this kind is happening in the place where you're uh, from. It's a, a poem by a poet named Seamus Heaney. Um, writing things down, that's S-E-A-M-U-S-H-E-A-N-E-Y. I said that too fast, didn't I? You can get that from me. Afterwards, uh, Elsa Wants, great um, Northern Irish poet, um, who, as I said, was in uh, Spain in the summer of 1969 at the time when um, uh, police and uh, military figures fired on uh, civil rights demonstrators in the um, Catholic minority neighborhood of Belfast, and he produced in the mid-1970s this poem, uh, Summer 1969, uh, which I'll read parts of. Uh, uh, I don't have all of it here, and forgive me, I'm getting interrupted occasionally uh, to explain words that I think might be unfamiliar, and that's going to disrupt its rhythm, and that's a bad thing to do with a huge poem, but um, I think it might be necessary just to explain some things. Summer 1969. While the constabulary covered the mob firing into the poles, I was suffering only the bullying son of Madrid. Each afternoon in the casserole heat of the flat, as I sweated my way through the life of Joyce, stinks from the fish market rose like the reek off a flax band. So he's in Madrid, he can smell this fish market during the summer. If you've been around a fish market during the summer, it can be pretty strong smell, and it reminds him of these dams back in Northern Ireland where he was from that were made uh, to foster the growing of flax, which is necessary for um, creating linen, which is a central industry in Northern 
pile. And so he's, he's in Madrid. Someone says to him, go back, try to touch the people. Another conquered war, a great writer in Spanish for about politics from his hill. We sat through death counts and bullfight reports on the television. Celebrities arrived from where the real things still happen. I retreated to the cool of the Prado, which is the great park museum in the grid. Goya's shooting is of the 3rd of May, covered a wall. The thrown up arms and spasm of the rebel. The helmeted and knapsack military. The efficient reek of the fuselage. Also, that home gang, a kind of duel, where two berserks club each other to death for honor's sake, weaved, armored, in a bog, and sinking. And then Heaney concludes the poem by saying about Goya, he painted with his fists and elbows, flourished the stained cape of his heart as history charged. So um, I want to use these last couple of lines to suggest how one might respond humanistically to the kinds of things I had up on the screen, to the kind of events I described um, earlier. I want to suggest that Charlottesville might stand alongside Parkland as a place in regard to which the humanities may provide the fundamental enabling vocabulary. And just to skip ahead, I want to say that I think Charlottesville and Parkland stand together as instances in which the best virtues of the humanities are enacted not by old people like me, but by young people who insist on applying immediately in the present principles they associate with other places and times. So I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm gonna continue as I've been focusing a little bit on my own experience, and that's partly to acknowledge that in the immediate aftermath of the events in Charlottesville last August, um, there was a lot of inarticulateness among local adults, including myself. We, we hadn't known, we'd been divided as to what to do in anticipating um, this, and a lot of us didn't feel as if we knew what to say about what had happened. And so we were immensely grateful when Vice News very quickly, kind of astonishingly, put together this documentary describing the events. And these two um, quite young women who had put the thing together at great risk to themselves uh, we're still around in Charlottesville a couple of days later when there was a vigil to try to reclaim the, the campus. And I found myself as uh, part of a line um, walking up to them, just, just thanking them for putting into words what most of us felt we hadn't been able um, uh, to. And so, you know, part of what I want to point to here is this sense of inarticulateness and uh, what it is to, you, uh, to use the humanities to try to get um, beyond that. And I, I turned out to be fortunate in this regard because I uh, accidentally provided myself with a kind of uh, canvas for uh, addressing what had um, happened. Uh, in December 2016, on the night um, when uh, Rex Tillerson was announced as the nominee for Secretary of State, I got in touch with a colleague of mine in the anthropology department, and we planned that night a course that we'd offer the following fall, this past fall, called Global Resistance and Student Activism. Um, it was the way that I was able to sling through the, that news. Um, but it was also an attempt uh, to try to anticipate something we thought in December 2016 might happen in the ensuing months. We imagined that our students would respond to occasions like the appointment of Tillerson by thinking that they need to turn away from any notion of the global as a site in which, in relation to which they could be involved, and focus instead exclusively on the local. Uh, UVA, like a lot of institutions uh, these days, has been trying to provoke students into thinking about themselves as, you know, you hear phrases like global citizens, but engaging with some notion of the, the global. And we imagine that the appointment of Tillerson as a kind of uh, signaling of a combination of uh, corporate and political power might make our students think there's nothing for us to be, nothing for us to do at that level anymore. We've got to focus exclusively on the local. So we thought we'd offer a course that was um, focused on the global uh, that might allow our students to think about their activities on that um, scale. 
And so uh, this was a once a week course. Um, most courses at UVA are three credits or four credits. This was only one um, credit. We enrolled about 50 uh, students. About half of them were students like the ones who'd been on the lawn on the night of August 12th. Central uh, activist students on grounds. The other half were first and second year students, freshmen, sophomores who were hoping to learn from these more activist students and maybe from um, us. And so uh, by having this class in which many of the most involved students were um, participating, I got to uh, have a little bit more uh, access to student response to uh, the events of August than I might have um, otherwise. And a couple of things I want to say then about the student responses reflected in the class. For one, while, uh, while we adults, and I, I mean here specifically the university administration, but the faculty too I would talk to, and also the uh, police officials, really uh, had been very ham-fisted in anticipating August uh, 12th. The students were ready for it in all kinds of ways. The graduate students had put together this quite amazing document you can find online called the Charlottesville Syllabus for publication on August 12th. They wanted to have a document out that would put the events of August 12th in historical context that could be read on the day of the uh, uh, event. Um, similarly, while the rest of us were trying to figure out and were feeling inarticulate in the days after the events, the Black Student Alliance very quickly issued a series of demands, which again you can find online, and, and which are really quite uh, powerful, a number of which have been enacted, some of which are still uh, uh, being debated, uh, that were meant to phrase not just, not just a black student response, not just a student response, but a university response to the um, events. And so it became clear that students were finding means for acting rather quickly um, uh, in uh, relation to these events. At the same time, the class made very clear that there were deep divisions among the students in the same way there had been among uh, the adults. And the class wound up becoming this forum for the playing out of those uh, differences. And I can describe those differences if you're interested um, in them. And they can be boiled down to, in effect, whether students should be cooperating with the university in response to the events of August and uh, beyond, or seeing the university as an antagonist because of its own uh, racial history and its complicity um, uh, to some degree in those uh, uh, events. Um, uh, the other thing about the class that was uh, very striking to me was I had imagined it as a social science class. I thought a class called Global Resistance and Student, student Activism was going to be a course essentially in the sociological analysis of what makes uh, students' resistant movements effective, and I was teaching it with an anthropologist who provided the course with that kind of theoretical vocabulary. We began with that. But what I found from the students was that they were interested in vocabularies that I would associate more with the humanities. For one, um, they were very much interested in the history of student resistance. And we, we had meant that to be part of the course. We had ordered this book for it. It's a pretty good um, uh, book. But they were very interested throughout in terms of placing their own uh, ongoing and anticipated activities in a kind of historical context. Second, I had built into the course study of the Greek um, tragedy and Sophocles play Antigone, uh, partly because that's a play that over time has been, over, has been used over and over again, has been staged over and over again as a kind of political intervention, and I thought it would be useful uh, to consider that play briefly uh, as such a possible intervention. And I focused particularly upon a performance of Antigone that was undertaken in Ferguson not long after the um, killing of, of Michael Brown. It was um, undertaken in, in Ferguson with a cast that was made up of members of the Ferguson Police Department, um, uh, teachers who had taught at the school that Michael Brown had attended a real um, heterogeneous representation of the community. And I had thought that we would study this text just briefly and then let it go, and it really wound up becoming, in some ways, the central uh, text for the course. The students in the class were really interested in thinking about uh, 
the issues that they were focused on locally in terms of this very broad um, uh, kind of sweeping historical uh, context that the play might provide in a way that struck me as very um, consistent with sort of old style humanistic values. The one other thing I want to mention from the, the course, and I can return to it if you're um, interested when we um, uh, chat in a couple of minutes, but um, the students were very much interested in the way in which student organization had been rendered most effective in the past century when students had aligned with other communities. And so here's an instance from uh, Paris at the time of the Vietnam War when you have students marching with labor unions, but the students were equally interested in student organizations that had aligned with religious groups and with a whole series of other um, entities. And I suppose that's one aspect of the class that might be thought of as, you know, have historical, have um, sociological. But in, in any case, a class that I thought was going to be largely a social science class um, turned out to be one very much in which the students um, embraced a kind of humanistic vocabulary. And I, I mean to commend that in um, some ways. So um, I'm going to use this um, point about alliance with uh, external organizations to refer uh, to the last point, which I'll try to cover more briefly. As Professor Graves mentioned, I run something at UVA called the Center for the Liberal Arts, which since the mid-1980s has provided free professional development <coughs> programs for K-12 teachers. And we provide these in subject matter ranging from biology and uh, algebra to the arts, uh, you know, whatever, wherever there feel, seems to be um, any kind of need that the university can uh, to address. And um, in keeping with the kind of um, narrative that I've been presenting to you about students acting um, rather quickly and decisively, I kind of bided my time as to how to respond to the events of uh, August. I didn't want to uh, conflict with other um, university uh, interventions, but by uh, late October, I went to two partners we worked with previously, uh, the Carter Winston Institute, which runs uh, African and African American Studies at, uh, at UVA, and the Southern Poverty Law Center's Teaching Tolerance um, Project, which I, I hope some of you are familiar with. Teaching Tolerance is really um, the most efficacious organization in the United States for thinking about education in relation to uh, diversity. Um, I, I, I don't, I mean, I think that's almost without debate. And so we worked with them on programs for teachers in the past, and I went to them and said, uh, what, what should we do for teachers in response to the events of uh, August? And they, uh, Teaching Tolerance was about to um, uh, launch this new curriculum called Teaching Hard History, which has gotten some national attention, which you may have seen reference uh, to. And we, they decided to launch it at this event that we ran last month. So uh, I really commend the Teaching Hard History framework um, to you. It is meant to address a tremendous shortfall in the teaching of uh, slavery and a whole series of uh, histories, uh, a whole series of American um, histories, uh, and it proposes to do those in uh, really powerful ways. Um, in uh, Starting at the beginning of last summer, a bunch of high school and college students had begun working with the Winston Center at UVA to create a, an online history of white supremacy in Charlottesville. And this I commend to you as well, and was the other aspect of the program we did for teachers. It's called The Illusion of Progress. And um, particularly because, as I was learning from Professor Graves, even the site of this building has some of the same kind of history I've been describing with um, Charlottesville. Even this campus has a history of uh, displacement, and you know we had lunch in a, uh, a, a building on uh, on White Street that uh, is in the site of a business created from a, created by an escaped slave from Virginia. You have a lot of these same histories uh, locally, and student efforts towards commemorating those um, histories. This would show you can be enormously powerful. So when we do these programs for teachers, we're very happy if we have about 50 people in the room. We had closer to 150 
for this event in mid-March. Um, um, uh, the teachers were remarkable. So do understand this is a this was a Saturday. Uh, teachers drove as many as uh, six hours to come uh, there for a program that started at nine o'clock in the morning. So do the math, right? Um, so these are people who taught all day Friday and still managed to get to Charlottesville by 9 a.m. Um, Saturday to talk about some of the hardest stuff that teachers um, can uh, do. And by uh, two days after the event, some of the teachers were already posting ways in which they had uh, applied the conversations uh, that had happened on that Saturday in their classrooms on Monday. Here's a blog post from a teacher who was there named Jessica Shin, who teaches in uh, Charlottesville and only began in uh, Richmond and only began teaching in the fifth grade there in January and has already set um, to doing this work. So I mean to uh, present both the students who are in my class in the fall and these teachers as modeling what I take to be uh, represented by these lines from Heaney's um, poem. And there's a detail I want to point out uh, about these lines um, that's important to what I've been trying to say about uh, temporality. Um, it seems to me that this is an image, can, can you all see it? I'm, I'm talking close here. But um, it seems to me that this is an image of immediate engagement, right? He's describing Goya as essentially a bullfighter who's trying to use the stained cape of his heart in response to a charge from history. And that's to describe the artist as immediate and present, and present as it seems to me you possibly could. But the thing I also want to point out uh, about it is that it is in a basic way a very slow line. It's describing this immediate, dramatic, uh, passionate, you know, necessarily it's, a, it's an image of rapidity, right? Flourishing this um, cave. But it would be a very hard pair of lines to read quickly both because of the placement of the comma and because of the way in which Heaney has set up the combination of vowel sounds and consonants. I'm pointing to the A's and the R's here. So that, I, I don't know, you could experiment with this, uh, I suppose. But it seems to me it's necessary, necessary to say slowly, he painted with his fists and elbows, flourished the stained heat of his heart as history charred. It seems to me those words, which are in some ways the the central ones, a kind of image, a bloody image of artistic involvement, are necessary to read slowly because of the um, duplicated vowel um, sound. So I, I mean to, to summon those lines partly by way of tribute to the rapidity of the response of the uh, uh, Marjorie Stone and Douglas uh, students. I again want to contrast this with the um, inarticulateness that many of us felt that made us so grateful for the documentary when it was produced again uh, by young people last uh, August. But in suggesting a kind of tension between the fast action that the lines describe and the slowness with which they have to be read if you try to read them out loud, a kind of tension between what the poem says and what the poem is, or what the poem says and what the poem um, sounds like. It seems to me you've got a kind of combination of an image of immediate action uh, linked still to the kind of patience that the humanities have long been associated with. And one of my favorite descriptions of that uh, association is from President John F. Kennedy when, as it turned out shortly before his uh, death, he commemorated uh, the memorial to the poet Robert Frost at Amherst um, College. And he talked about how poetry serves as a kind of check against power. He said, when power leads men towards arrogance, poetry reminds him of his limitations. When power narrows the areas of man's concern, poetry reminds him of the richness and diversity of his existence. So we've got on the one hand this notion of uh, the humanities is the thing that slows you down, that um, uh, helps you to avoid a certain kind of rash action. It seems to me, too, though, that the recent months have shown young people harnessing vocabulary previously associated with the arts and humanities to insist on immediate action, not in response to other immediate action, 
They haven't been suckered into thinking that events like August 12th come out of nowhere, or events like February 14th come out of nowhere, but rather they've taken a kind of long view. They've understood violence uh, in terms of what a writer named Rob Nixon calls slow violence. He says, we are accustomed to conceiving violence as immediate and explosive, erupting into instant <coughs> concentrated visibility. But we need to revisit our assumptions and consider the relative invisibility of slow violence. I mean, a violence that is neither spectacular nor instantaneous, but instead incremental, whose calamitous repercussions are postponed for years and decades or centuries. And Nixon describes slow violence in relation to environmental devastation, but a bunch of my students these days are thinking about Nixon's uh, vocabulary in terms of racial violence. Um, too, that we, we're apt to focus on these singular moments as if they are singular, isolated uh, moments, and that they need to be understood instead in terms of the long view represented, for instance, by documents like the um, uh, Charlottesville syllabus. So my students and the teachers who came to the event in March, it seems to me, have taken the long view of uh, uh, op oppression. And the Marjorie Stone Doug Douglas students immediately placed their own tragedy in a very large context. They used vocabulary that talked about the event not as singular and isolated, but as about a very broad history and uh, politics. And I think it's appropriate that a lot of folks have, have um, focused on those students as harnessing social media and as that being the source of their efficacy. I would also want to know uh, how much of, of, of their efficacy clearly derives from their experience in theater, which many of them were involved with actually at the time of the um, attack on their uh, school. And it's a Charlottesville writer named Dahlia Blithwick, who some of you may be familiar with at U.S. International Public uh, Radio, who has made, made this point by saying that the students of Doug, Stone and Douglas ought to be understood as reflections of study of the arts and civics and of enrichment of a kind that is uh, still present at that, that very affluent school, but that is largely being um, <coughs> zeroed out of American curricula. She doesn't say in favor of, of, of STEM, and I don't mean to, to trash um, uh, STEM as a way of doing it, but it is a way in which we can say that what they've accomplished is, is a function of their training in the humanities. So I want to close with one last image. Um, here, we have a lot of statues at the University of Virginia. I mentioned one controversial one. We also have this one right in the center of the central squad of uh, Homer, uh, the, the ancient Greek um, poet. And that's the one statue on campus on which students are always draping things. They cover Homer with just about everything. Uh, I, I, you know, because I don't want to, like you may have friends at UVA, and I don't want to provoke anything. So I'm just giving you a kind of harmless image of of Homer with a flower, but uh, you can go online and see Homer covered with all kinds of sometimes kind of gross uh, <laughs> stuff uh, there. And I just mean to say that Homer has become uh, on campus a kind of figure of fun because he's central spatially, but he's understood to be peripheral in terms of the central events that happen on um, campus. And it seems to me that humanists in our time are offering us a very different version of what the humanities and the arts can contribute in moments of crisis. Um, figures like Cornell West, who I know uh, has been one of the uh, figures brought out by Denver Project, a humanistic inquiry, um, Judith Butler, and uh, Tanis Coates, who was one of the principal figures talked about at the teacher's event on, on March 17, a, a lot of uh, much less prominent uh, scholars are, I think, uh, allowing people to think about the humanities as responding immediately while still providing that broad uh, context in terms of time and history. And that, that uh, leads me to think that we may be reaching a moment in which the humanities may be deployed with really a new kind of power towards insisting on the lives that must be made newly to matter now. So thanks very much for listening to me. Thank So there's a, there's a good crowd, so um, I'm going to ask that you keep your questions short so we can get as many of them in as possible. I think we have roughly 20, 
maybe 25 minutes uh, for Q&A. So, uh, and I know some of you guys have to go before that. If you do, don't be Yeah, if you have a class, obviously, uh, we really follow up this one. Feel free to step out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, 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 I'm very interested in this idea of, uh, of immediate response to humanities, but the slow view of forcing. I think that's what you're saying, right? Yeah. And um, it, it seems like uh, this is something that sometimes we have been pushed away from by uh, other forces, by uh, the market, by yeah. a market, a market view of the community. Yes. yes. Uh, and I wonder if you think that there, as things are happening like in, in Wisconsin, with the university there, with the uh, stripping of uh, majors in English, history, philosophy, I wonder if you think that this is the time, how can we word this in a way that would, uh, how can we word this to the world? This need for the small view, the historical view, the, the literary view, or the philosophical view, and uh, as a real world issue, like how can we explain that to students and to administrators and I guess to the world at large? Yeah. So you know, to me, part of why this is the question you raise is such an important one is that for for folks like like us, for folks on the faculty. For a long time, it's been a kind of professional suicide if you tried to write about present and immediate uh, occasions, because that would be viewed as sort of journalistic and uh, ephemeral and the kind of stuff that's supposed to be in newspapers, not in academic journals and so on. And so there's a way in which the long view has been commended to try to ensure a certain kind of academic irrelevance. And part of how I would respond by saying it does seem to me that the political economics of publishing in higher education are changing such, so that I find my graduate students to take as an absolute given that they have to write for the, you know, in my discipline, it would be something like the LA Review of Books. That both, um, so, you know, again, a, a fundamental fact for all of us on the faculty is if you submit something to an academic journal, it takes forever for the thing to come out. And some of that is for honorable processes, like your uh, review. Uh, some of it is just because of inefficiencies. And some of it sometimes feels conspiratorial to guarantee the irrelevance of whatever you uh, have said with any uh, urgency. It's even worse in terms of book publishing. But for my students, they, they take as a given that they have to short circuit that. That the conditions of publishing uh, in which I was raised are going to be irrelevant to their careers finally anyway. And while this has some negative economic consequences for them, potentially, it has, it seems to me, some really positive consequences in terms of the way they perceive their audiences, both in terms of something like immediate publication and also in terms of writing for audiences beyond the uh, academy. So I, I, think, I think we're in a period where these kinds of processes are changing for us and where it has to become inevitable for more immediate response uh, and more public-oriented response in the humanities um, uh, to be s sanctioned by institutions. I, 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 I'm wary about that for one particular reason, which is the way it has uh, turned up in the sciences, which have had this pressure previously, where they've had to show you know, public efficacy for their research for a long time to get anything out of the um, you know, NSF or something like that. And it is often meant you know, that these kinds of pressures become the car leaving the, the horse. And so I wouldn't want uh, any scholar to feel that you can't write about what you think of as most intellectually urgent because you're driven to respond to the, the, the present. What I, what I hope I'm talking about is possibilities that might become uh, available to us rather than new constraints. Is, is that an answer? Yeah, I, I think so. And I think it, it, it applies to students, too. Like, like, I would like to see more, not just one newspaper at Metro State, but uh, you know, a, a proliferation of voices about local politics. And about, I mean, the national stuff is very important as well, of course. But it seems like the, this is a time where that could and should happen. I'm just not sure how we can encourage it and bring it about. So that's why I was interested that you guys are doing that. So if, 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 you know, so part of what I was trying to do is to offer you who are students a kind of pep talk here in association with study of the humanities, that it can have consequence for things that might matter um, to you particularly. And part of what I'd be trying to suggest is that there's a way in which the coverage of the Parkland students tries to pretend as if those students are just social media junkies and not involved in intellectual activity. And I think that's preposterous. I think they've been unbelievably 
uncanny at sussing out the history and politics of the issues that they're interested in. So I just would mean to be saying to you that thinking about how your the academic work that you're doing might apply for writing to the kind of um, uh, newspapers that Craig is, is talking about it seems to me very much worth your while. And the Parkland students would be uh, example. The Parkland students and students associated with them. There are plenty of other students who've been talking about these issues for a long time, but haven't gotten the attention that the Parkland um, students uh, have. But they have in common uh, using. Uh, their learning to deploy into political uh, action, and I think we all should be doing um, as much as we can to encourage students. You know that that seems to be the model of advocacy that has the uh, greatest possibility for us at the present moment. Anybody else? Please. I was curious if you followed the uh, activism of the students who participated in your program after they completed it. Was it a sustained effort, or did it kind of die off after a while? No, they haven't quit at all. They haven't stopped beating each other up. Um, and a lot of what we talked about in, I, I don't mean that literally, but they haven't stopped <laughs> arguing with each other about how um, this should happen. And so one of the things we talked about a lot in the class was whether that kind of um, uh, internal combating within the student movements was a problem or whether it might be a kind of plus. And that history that I put uh, on the screen argues that the, one of the principal strengths of the divestment movement, the student movement of trying to advocate divestment uh, from, of corporations from in their investments in South Africa, that the infighting in that movement was part of what sustained its prominence for a long enough period of time so that it could do the work. So I, I actually feel, feel pretty hopeful that as long as these students continue to respond to each other antagonistically, that that's going to sustain the energy of the thing, but also sustain attention to the, the thing. So they, they but the, um, I, I can say uh, unequivocally that there's been no, um, no diminishment of that energy and no diminishment of that activity um, on the UVA campus. I think it's been very discouraging for them to have this experience of the way in which these historical events happen, and then the rest of the country sort of moves on um, and is focused on other uh, places and other uh, times. And I, I heard for the first time the other day, you know, I mentioned that the day that the um, white supremacists came to the campus was August 11th. Uh, last week, for the first time, I heard uh, one of my junior colleagues refer to that day as 8 11. Um, and clearly meaning to summon a kind of parallel to 9-11 uh, there. And I'm, I've, been puzzling, I've been trying to puzzle ever since what I think about that, whether that takes its long history and uh, sets it in a single moment as the kind of thing maybe that you do move on um, from, or whether that insists on the importance of it in such a way so that it's liable to prompt sustained response. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure what I think about it. Yeah, please. Uh, earlier you mentioned the uh, uh, book on student development. Boren, B-O-R-E-N. Should I put it back up on the screen? Would that be helpful to you? Did you get the talk? Yeah, okay. Yeah. If you look book Boren and student activism, there's a lot of used copies circulating online. I hope none of them are ones that my students sold. <laughs> that, would be, that would belie my response to this gentleman. <laughs> or maybe they don't think they, they need the book anymore. Anyway. Maybe they are history. Yeah. Please. Yeah, I, I have a very simple question, but it's going to take me a bit, with apologies, Adam, a, bit, a little while to get there. Okay, I'm going to lean on my lectern. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking, well, thank you for your presentation and thank you for introducing political activism. You know, um, you're not political science, I'm political science. We talk about political activism. And I know that Larry Johnson and Humanities have a long standing tradition of, human, um, of political activism. So thank you for that. Um, but, you know, naturally, you're the expert in your field. And, um, and my question is directed to more um, the literature, arts um, type of political activism. 
in academia, do you think that given 2018, we're still trying to revisit, perhaps I, I am, what really went wrong in intellectual combat, as it were, against racism, misogyny, xenophobia, homophobia, anything you want to introduce there. Hatred is coming up. And, and suddenly, you know, I mean, with all due respect to my colleague, you know, we, we see this urgency that certain things haven't been perhaps, you know, addressed correctly, and we need to do it. And it's not only in the United States. I mean, even in Central Europe and Western Europe and whatever, Eastern Europe, Eastern Ukraine, hatred is up. So my question, and here is the simplicity, uh, in the academic context, context, what went wrong with liberal arts? That it is now that we're saying political activity. Did something go wrong in the way in which we teach? So, um, so I, I'm going to I'm going to answer the question in terms that it has been asked. Although I want to say at the start that I might I might quarrel with the premises um, uh, of it, which is to say just that, um, as you acknowledged at the beginning, there's been a tremendous amount of activism that's been on. Going and it's taken form the efficacy of which it seems to me to be um, demonstrated. I would say uh, that, for instance, if you compare sites like Northern Ireland to sites like the United States in terms of the prominence of the arts and uh, humanities, you might make a case for the way in which Northern Ireland, against all odds, achieved a certain degree of peace um, uh, in comparison to. Uh, the equivalence in the United States is perhaps a suggestion that um, you know that the arts and humanities haven't been given enough uh, attention. Actually, have been uh, efficacious and just have been subordinated in um, various ways. But let me try to give a response in terms of the question, and I'll try to give it um, in in terms of the uh, audiences that I described in my uh, in, in my talk. If if. Uh, my, my guess is that if any great majority, if you ask that question, take a majority of the teachers who showed up to the event we ran on March 17th, their response would be, the reason this have, hasn't been more efficacious has been because there's been too much of a concern about not offending white people. That, um, that, the need, that what needs to have happened has been self-evident for a very long time but that in K through 12 in particular, there has been a reluctance to antagonize uh, white parents uh, by introducing a narrative of historical responsibility that they might reject. And that in other levels of uh, education, there's been a similar reluctance in terms of donors and alumni and um, officials. And so, uh, you know, I suppose I would draw some parallel to uh, what we haven't done environmentally, given the evidence we have uh, before us. I don't think there's been any absence of knowledge. I think there has been an absence of a certain kind of political will. And what I think we are seeing in the present moment is a sense of emergency that means that constituencies that have them thought of themselves as necessarily powerless, like high school students, for instance, have said, we can't not try to intervene because we can't count on the people we were counting on to make these um, interventions. And so what I thought I was hearing among the teachers on March 17th is that they felt enough sanctioned by the teaching a hard history framework so that they were going to go ahead and do this and they were going to have the fights with their principals and they were going to have the fights with, with white parents as uh, necessary in order to get this um, done. And so. You know, I, I suppose um, then the simple answer that I'm trying to give is that maybe we haven't had enough guts. You know, may, may, maybe higher education would be one place where it's been very clear where what has been necessary, where the knowledge has existed for a long time, where because of political economies of publication, because of uh, certain kinds of ambitions, because of some principles that we inherited 
that aren't ethically bad principles, but that haven't served us very well, I think we've been reluctant to insist on um, the outcomes that are implicit in our own uh, knowledge. Uh, that, that would be a stab. Anyway, I don't think it's anything we don't know. Please. Um, so first of all, I'm, I don't truly agree. Well, thanks for coming and talking about it. It's been a pleasure. But. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, well, I don't agree with the hate groups and what they do, but my question is, do you believe that there is utility within the hate groups being open as opposed to being underground? Um, do they do more harm by being underground, or is it better for them to be brought to the forefront so we can actually address things and sometimes uh, reason and talk about them? So, so as, a, as a means to addressing issues that have needed to be addressed anyways. Um, so I'm, I'm going to, there's some basic way in which I feel I don't have a right to answer the question, and I'll, I'll explain why. I don't live in the center of Charlottesville. I don't live in a place where they're likely to come to. I can't say to my friends and colleagues and neighbors who these folks were trying to intimidate and drive out of their towns that there's any out of their houses, that there's any good to be served by having these folks marching with torches in their neighborhoods. I understand how intellect, so my temptation is to say absolutely yes, because if these folks weren't above ground, I probably wouldn't be talking to you all about this, and we wouldn't be generating a vocabulary right. for doing this. And colleges are exactly the place to have those kinds of things. Part of what's remarkable to me about Charlottesville is that for a moment, the university came, became the place where these folks come to, so that we couldn't claim to be above the fray anymore. But you know, to go back to this gentleman's question, we have for a long time acted as if we're uh, in some sense above the fray. So we can say, well, it's great that these people are visible now, so that now we have a, can develop a vocabulary for talking about them and responding to them. And I would just say at whose expense that is. And I'm not, I, I don't have a single neighbor whose uh, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness I'm willing to um, uh, trade in for my being able to talk better about these um, people. Anyway, the Southern Poverty Law Center had documented these groups for a very long time. If we wanted to know what they were like and what we were, what they were up to, we could have figured it out without them having to come to our our town. So I think so. I think there's a good that may be uh, served by this, but I, I can't describe it as a kind of overall good. I feel like that's that that's to give insufficient acknowledgement to the pain of the folks who have to live where these things happen was very important. I wouldn't right. say it's, it's good, more more so it's just like there's utility. There's utility, I, I absolutely national, agree. It's, national it's, one, it's, one of those, it's one of those evils we may produce good ends to, but it, it should prompt us to think that we better, we, we, we better be involved, we better not wait for it to come to Metropolitan state, or where, where, wherever you're thinking of, is the place where you might have that rational conversation. Please, uh, when me and my friends casually refer to Charlottesville, what we're referring to is this perceived single event and a racist event at that. Um, I was raised in Aurora, and uh, after yeah. after the Aurora Theater shooting. Um, Many, many people who didn't know uh, uh, or was unfamiliar with Aurora, um, that, that was their first uh, perception of it. And uh, so I just wanted to ask you as a resident, how, how do you respond or react to, to this national or uh, international immediate uh, reputation, if you will? You know, so uh, you and I have in common knowing how strange it is to, to live in a place that has become one of those places that people have a certain kind of association with. Uh, I think, so my, so I, so you ask me how do I respond, and the answer would be I get bummed out, but the how should I respond, it seems to me has been very precisely um, modeled by the Marjorie Stone and Douglas kids, who it took less than a week for them to distract attention away from the single 
event and get focused on broader questions, including their predecessors in African American communities who've been pointing to uh, gun violence for years unattended beforehand. They made that connection, it seems to me, very quickly, right? And so it seems to me that, the, that my response ought to have been from the beginning to do some version of what I tried to do today to say this isn't just one event. And the event in Aurora didn't just suddenly come out of nowhere. It, you know, for these things to happen in Colorado where there's a certain um, kind of history in relation to guns that's different from uh, what we have in Virginia really matters in terms of this. And so it seems to me the response to the trivializing of Aurora should be you know, I'm repeating myself in the talk here, but to take a broad view, to do the kind of thing the humanities teach us to do, and to place that thing in its context, so people will think of Aurora not as a distinct place, but as the United States. Thank you. Please, yes. Uh, I want to mention, uh, first, uh, Daily Wire magazine, and technology magazine, for about the past year, has run a series of articles, uh, notably one cover article, that uh, the humanities, the people that come from the humanities, will be the next uh, hires for technology companies. Right. They uh, are looking more to humanities to solve the problems, rather than the application of the solution. And so I think it's notable that from philosophy and English, um, especially in choosing higher up in uh, project management, uh, humanity serves a very important role, or will be, uh, yes. in the future. Um, also notably, you were just saying about that, that narrative or that lesson from a place like Aurora or uh, uh, Parkland. I think it's also important to, in a way, appropriate what that message or that lesson is. I would say that both America and Israel, following 9-11 and the Holocaust, had some perversions of the message but the public and history defining never again, both of those, did set the narrative. Um, I was struck by um, the, uh, the uh, Columbine shooting, as you were just talking about that, because a survivor of the Columbine shooting is a Republican state congressman or Congress or a state senator living at Castle Rock right now. And the narrative appropriate for that purpose is one of heavy Second Amendment support. So it's very interesting that you really do have to set what the lesson is. Right. And I definitely think the kids from Parkland are probably the best example of that I've seen in a long time. I actually am heavily inspired by the two CWU uh, because of that measured type of lesson rather than just a okay, reaction. It's actually very uh, So th this, uh, I, I said I was going to try to give an upbeat talk. The downbeat version of this would have focused not on Seamus Heaney, but on the poet William Butler Yeats, who says antecedent, proved over and over again that what happens when you put really powerful language out there is that it gets appropriated in all kinds of ways, uh, counter to what those who had originated it meant to do, where it can go in any possible um, direction. And I, I think of that image that circulated widely, ostensibly, of uh, Gonzalez uh, tearing up the Constitution. And I think it's still early days in knowing exactly how the Parkland message will play out. It, it, it shouldn't be surprising to any of us if, if it goes according to the kind of trajectory that you're um, describing. This is where thinking of these students as involved uh, importantly with social media, which still has a relatively short history in terms of this kind of circulation for discourse, although there are some test cases we could point to um, in uh, relation to it. I'm, I'm not sure how that um, aspect of it is going to go. It does seem to me, again, that some serious notion of contextualization is potentially a helpful check against those kinds of Meanderings, but it's, it's, there's no guarantee well, to it. The interesting yeah. about what they have done is in the wake of Columbine, there was mourning. Right. And obviously, from a second hand support standpoint, you always hear uh, them pushing you towards mourning. Right. 
but function prayer, thoughts of prayer. But, yeah. prayer. but um, and we changed the profile picture to the flag of the country it happened. But they have actually had engagement immediately within morning. And as we see, people who are mourning who are also engaged often are very moving, uh, yeah. both politically and socially, uh, historically. And however mistakes can be made there, I think that that's a very interesting thing to immediately be public and involved by uh, humans. Yeah. So I, you know, in pointing to their background in theater, which a number of them had, what I would be meaning to do is to say that this um, narrative that their opponents have tried to develop, that they're phonies, that they're crisis actors, that they've been put up to it, and so on, well, very importantly to be reframed in terms of the authority that we associate with actors. And that what these folks figured out how to do was how to perform their mourning, not in a way that was false, but in a way that was dramatic in some way, and in a way that was persuasive. And that's where it seems to me you get some sense of it brilliance of the um, education and preparation that they, they had. So I think at this point, a lot, of the, a lot of the students that are still here are just being polite because they're going to be late for the next class. Oh, but please don't. Why don't we take, well, feel free to leave if you have a class, but why don't we just take one more question and then afterwards, I think Victor and I can hang out, I think Victor, you can hang here for a few minutes right. afterwards. We kind of do things in a more, um, you know, uh, less formal setting. If there's one last question, who wants the last word, as it were? How do you stay connected to you? Uh, but if you get a car. But if you get in touch with him, he knows how to get me. He and I are even Facebook friends. <laughs> <laughs> but, he know. taught me social media. <laughs> 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 <laughs>